I want to talk for a second about something from this week's Parsha. This week we're going to read the Parsha of Bamidbar. People read the you know, Bamidbar, there's a couple questions you could ask. Question number one is why did it work out? You know, the whole calendar, the, the whole Jewish calendar is really set up very precisely. Why is Bamidbar the Parsha that we read right before Shavuos? Question number one. And question number two, if you ever read the Parsha of Bamidbar, it's a very strange, strange, strange Parsha. Normally you're used to, when you read the Torah, action-packed, significant words, things, you know, like everything is really like you could ponder it, and there's a lot of explanations. If you read this week's Parsha, you'll see it re being read in Shul. What are the whole first, like, three or four chapters of the Book of Bamidbar talking about? Right? It's, it's counting the Jews. And every time we get counted over and over and over again, it repeats the same words, right? You're going to hear these words. You go to Shul, hopefully Shabbos, you listen to the Torah. It's going to talk about the same words over and over. I'll tell you now, you'll be here to keep hearing it on Shabbos. Told Osam, Lamish Bechosam, Lamesh Abosam. Before it counts every single tribe, it points out that it says that this tribe was counted, the Toldosam, according to their offspring, the Mishpachosam, according to their families, the Vesavosam, according to their father's houses, according to their tribes. And then it tells you the number of how many people were in each tribe. The question is obvious, right? We know the Torah is not in the business, right? You're not getting the author, you know, a sofer who writes a Torah, he doesn't get paid by the letter. Right, there's no reason to make the Torah longer. The Torah doesn't write extra words. Why not just tell me that the counting was according to the Mishpachosam, the Mesavosam, to the individual, to the father's house, to the tribe, and then just tell me the number of each tribe? Why repeat the whole introduction to each and everything over and over and over again? It happens many times. Same, in, really throughout the entire book of Bamidbar, you could ask the same question, because many times throughout this book, you'll see it constantly repeated. You'll see in, next, in, in the following week, Parsha, in Parsha's Nelson, when it talks about the sacrifices that were brought by the prince of each tribe. So it says that the prince of each tribe, you know, every prince of each tribe brought the identical sacrifice. So why does it have to go through and list the entire sacrifice over and over and over again 12 times? Just tell me the 12 guys' names. Tell me what they brought and say each guy brought the, brought the sacrifice. The Torah is doing this, according to the Maharal, to teach us an incredibly important lesson. That each person could bring the exact same sacrifice. Each, you know, I could bring 12 bulls, you could bring 12 bulls, you could bring 12 bulls, right? I could, we could, we could be counted and have the same number of people in our families. But my 12 bulls, even if the bull is the same, it's a different bull than your bull. And your, your bull is a different bull than my bull. What does that mean? These things represent, think about our prayers for a second. I'll explain, I'll explain it the best. Me and Rabbi Albert say the same Shmon Esra. The words in the Amidah that we say every day, three times a day, and you and every one of us, we're all saying the same exact words of prayer. So you might wonder, what do I need to go to Shul for? What's my place in Shul? What's my place in, in saying the Amida? I'm saying the same words as you, the same words as you, the same words as you. The words might be the same, but the feeling behind it, and the intention, and the understanding of the meaning is completely different. No two people's prayer is the same. You can say the same Shemon Ezra. I can say the same prayer 365 times in a year, but it's never the same prayer, because you're thinking something different. When I say the words, for example, I say the words in davening, Rifa'enu Hashem v'nei Rifei, heal us, God. So I might be thinking about the person I know who can't speak properly. He might be thinking about the person I know who's in a coma. You might be thinking about the person you know who, who has you know, any, any other disease in the world. When I say Baruch Aleinu, Hashem, give us a blessing that we should have, you know, this year should be a prosperous year. I might be thinking about the guy I know who lost his job. You might be thinking about a woman you know who lost her job. You might be thinking about someone you know whose family can't have food. We're saying the same words, but the inner content of each prayer is so different. The Torah is teaching us in this week's Parsha by the fact that it's saying, yeah, we were counted. And yeah, there were 300,000 in this tribe. And there were 300,000 in this tribe. And there were 300,000 in this tribe. Every single time the Torah gives the counting, it points out that we're counted, according to our families, to our individual offspring, and according to our, to our forefathers. So that every time the Torah says, don't think this guy's was the same as his, don't think his was the same, just like your two prayers aren't the same, 
The two sacrifices aren't the same because the intention behind it is different. And B'nai Yisrael needs all of our pre prayers. All our prayer, that's what makes up Kal Yisrael. There's a beautiful Mishnah in Pirkei Avos. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avos says, Al tehivaz l'chal adam. You should not embarrass any person. You should never like write anybody off. Don't like say this guy is nothing. We were talking about this before. We were talking about like how everybody had a, uh, this is the way most people explain the Mishnah. We were talking about before about how like in every high school class there's like that one geek who you think is like never good for anything. And then finally, like one day, like at the end of senior year, he comes up and he like, you know, he, he saves you because he had a police scanner and he was able to tell you the police were coming. Like, you know, just like everybody, everyone has that moment. That's how some people explain the Mishnah. Al the Adam. Don't, you know, push away anybody. Don't embarrass anybody. She'ein l'cha Adam, she'ein Shah. Because there's nobody who doesn't have their Shah. There's nobody who doesn't have their moment. So according to what we're explaining, you could explain, the way we're explaining this, you could read this mission another way. Don't embarrass every person. Because there's no person, no, no person, what is, there's another meaning for sha. Sha doesn't only mean moment. Sha means to turn to listen to someone's prayer. Right? When in the beginning of Beratius, when he's telling the story of Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel, so when Cain brings his sacrifice, the Torah says, the Al-Kayin the Al-Minhaso lo shah. The God didn't turn, he didn't pay attention to, to Cain's sacrifice. It also says in the Amida, if you if you dab in this Sfar, it's not in the Ashkenaz Amida, but if you dab in this Sfar, it says, Ritzei Hashem Elokeinu ba'amcha Yisrael. Hashem, you should be pleased with your people Israel. Belis filasam she'eh. In turn, pay attention to their prayer. So according to that, we can understand the Mishnah. Don't think that you're not important. Al tehivaz l'chal adam. Don't think that your prayer doesn't mean anything. She'ein l'chal adam. There's no person. She'ein lo shah. That to him, God is not going to turn to his prayer. God views everyone's prayer as unique. And everyone's prayer is important. And that's really the lesson that we're trying to do for Shavuos. As we're getting ready for Shavuos, we're saying, God, there's an opportunity. God is really asking the question, do you want the Torah? Every Shavuos, God asks the question, do you want the Torah or not? And you have, an, you have the opportunity. You could say either, yeah, we'll do it. We'll take the Torah upon ourselves. Or you could say like the other nations said, well, what's written in it? And don't think that your individual acceptance of the Torah is like, oh, you know, we got all the rabbis doing the Torah. Yeah, that's enough. You know, oh, you could do the same mitzvah as someone else. But your mitzvah is unique. It's not his mitzvah. The attention behind it is your mitzvah. Don't, don't put down yourself. Don't think that your contribution is not significant. Where did the other nations go wrong? This is really, I just wanted to, to finish up. Where did the other nations go wrong? There's a tremendous problem that people have. You say, you know, why shouldn't I accept something new on myself for the Torah? And we're all guilty. As I'm saying, like everybody, every single person goes through this. Why, what's stopping me from this Shavuos to say, you know what, Hashem, I'm accepting new mitzvahs on myself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be more strict with things I wasn't strict about, I'm gonna do more learning, I'm gonna take more acts of kindness upon myself to do. What's stopping us? The problem is that we're not living in the moment to seize the opportunity. The problem is we look what's behind us, what's in front of us. Sometimes we think, you know, well, in the past I was never good enough to do this. Who am I to all of a sudden start taking these things on? Like the other day, I'm like sitting there in South Beach, all of a sudden now I'm gonna be Mr. You know, religious guy over here, right? Or I don't have the background, my past is, I, I, like what am I doing? Like, I, like the other day I was in Pizza Hut, don't you expect me to start keeping kosher? Like what, what is that, right? And some people look at the future. Some people say, you know, it sounds nice, I wanna accept this today, but I know what's gonna happen. Three weeks from now, my old friends are going to come back. They're going to come back into town. I'm going to have to be together with them. You know, and, and I know I'm going to end up doing the thing, so I'm not even going to take this on myself now, because who am I really kidding? I know I'm not going to be able to hold it in the future. You know who does that? That's Amalek. People ever heard of Amalek? Amalek, their whole essence, Amalek is like our arch enemy, our spiritual enemy, the Torah writes about. How do we know that this is the, the, the trait of Amalek? 